Hey, this is Tim Brown, Hall of Famer. You're listening to Silver and Black Today. This is the Silver and Black Today podcast, your source for Raiders news and information. Now, here's your host, Swaggering Boisterously. All right, happy hump day. That's right. It is Wednesday, which means tomorrow the Raiders get back into camp, into real camp as the season gets underway, Raider Nation. I'm sure, like me, everyone's ready for it, this kind of dead period that we've had over the last six weeks uh, after football kind of got put aside for a little bit of break before the guys get back. I am Scott Colbrantz, and I am the founder and publisher of Silver and Black Today website, Raiders News website, uh, based here in Las Vegas, Nevada. This is our 54th edition of our podcast. In addition, we have a Sunday radio show on CBS Sports Radio, 1140 a.m. here in Las Vegas. So if you're in Las Vegas, you can listen to it over the air, wherever you may be in Sid City. If you're not in Las Vegas, Don't worry. You can check it out live on the radio.com app. We also put the show up about an hour or two after it's completed at 10 a.m. We have it up on our website, and uh, you'll soon find it in uh, SoundCloud and uh, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcasts and your music. You can find that on Sunday afternoon at the very latest late Sunday afternoon. So make sure you check that out. Visit the website. We've got a lot of great writers there. Um, and the, the show as well, the, the radio show, we have a great guest, national guest uh, with Raider background. We also do a little bit of football in addition to just the Raiders. Um, of course, you all listen because you're Raider fans and you want to hear about the team. Uh, but we stretch it out a little bit and talk about uh, o- overall football occasionally when it matters. Uh, and that's what we do. Tonight, I am fortunate to be joined by our senior NFL analyst Chris Reed who's going to uh, co-host the podcast with me tonight Chris how you doing my man good we made it through the dead zone <laughs> no it's right man it's crazy it's uh, it, this is uh, one of those times of the year where you even if you're a baseball fan you're just itching for football to start because there's nothing else going on and clearly with everything that happened over the offseason Chris uh, the Raiders you, you just want them to get back out there because you have the coaching staff everybody's got the faith that things are going to turn around uh, of course and then you got a bunch of players so it's it's one of those things where uh, you just can't wait for it because you've been talking about it for so many months and now they finally get to get out there yeah, it seems like every spot on the roster has at least one guy you can't wait to see get out on the field. Yeah, that's 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 true. The rookies and and the uh, and the vets that they signed. I mean, guys like Rashawn Melvin, guys like Derek Johnson, who you've heard about, and you're unsure. Some folks, you know, they they go either way. They might be a fan and say, well, they're they're a good addition, and other people might be skeptical. It's it's Raider Nation, and it seems to be uh, on some guys. It's definitely a fifty fifty split. But there's no doubt, Chris, going into this camp, there, there was there was obviously a lot of hope last year and a lot of, I think, um, positive vibes despite the coaching changes with, with Todd Downing. Uh, but, but that was soon dashed after the start of the season. This time, I think, with the coaching staff, with the players and everything that's going on with Chucky coming back, it just has a really nice feel and an excitement that I think has been lacking for a few years. I mean, with just John Gruden alone, I mean, even if he was the only coach on the whole staff, I know everybody would be excited. And then he brought in guys like Paul Gunther, Derek Ansley, you know, so this is the best staff that they've had probably since the last time Gruden was here. Yeah, no doubt. And and it's it's great, too, because I think their style, Chris, you think about coaches are coaches. They, they got another football. They have to go have good schemes, whether it be offense or defense. At the same time, I think that edge that this staff brings in too, and especially when you look at Gruden and you look at Gunther um, and then a couple of the other assistants, they really have that edge. And you, you feel like this team's going to come out, be more physical, be more intense. And that to me is a big, big deal because if you're going to win and you're going to start to turn this thing around where people want it to be to achieve the greatness, I think that Raider fans and Raider Nation has been waiting for for decades. Uh, that is an important factor to me uh, to get the talent, to get people motivated. 
Oh, and and how exciting is it going to be to see the Raiders defense actually get after somebody? <laughs> I mean, Paul Gunther just he loves coming with blitzes. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that aggressive nature and and getting back to some kind of uh, uh, smash mouth uh, on the defense side, Raider football. You also see it on the offensive side as well. And we'll talk a little bit about offense because you wrote a story up on silverandblacktoday.com about some of um, uh, Gruden's philosophy, especially as it it relates to RPOs. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to start kind of with some news and, and what's happening as we roll into camp. Of course, the rookies a couple days ago. Uh, showed up and the veterans report tomorrow with the first practice being on Friday. But we already had a a physically unable to perform list uh, release from the Raiders. And there was one surprise on it. And then I think the surprise for a lot of us was those folks that were not on it, which was a good sign. But if you look at the the list, uh, Chris, you had PJ Hall. I think I think you and I both were surprised by that one, uh, having that rookie come in and 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 he, you know, they talked a lot about him uh, in minicamp and that he had really performed well. And then to see him on that list when we hadn't heard anything really about him being injured, it does seem like every year there's like one rookie that shows up. He's fine through minicamp, and then you know he's on the pup list to start training camp. Um, I really hope it's a short term thing with him because I was really excited to see PJ Hall this year. Yeah, and I, I, Matt and I were talking on the radio show and, and actually after the show about PJ Hall, and I like him. I think he, he, if he gets healthy, of course, which hopefully this is just an, a, you know a little bit of a, a, a nagging injury at the beginning of the season, but won't be there for a while. Is is he'll be a rotational player, but I think he has a really possibility to develop into a guy that's going to make a difference there. Now, the other guy on the list that was surprising, not surprising, uh, is Donald Penn. Uh, and this is an interesting one for me, Chris, because with Donald Penn being on that pup, and again, just so people understand, on that list starting training camp uh, does not mean they're inactive. They're still active, uh, and they just need a little extra time, and they're hopefully going to get out there pretty quickly. But with Donald Penn, I'm just I'm blown away. Really, I've seen a lot of Raider Nation in the last few days basically want to toss him aside and use the money to go sign other guys. I, I I'm not a fan of that because remember the position he plays, remember the quarterback you had, and what's happened to him the last couple of years with injuries. I just don't see getting rid of him unless it's late in camp and Colton Miller lights the world on fire, which I'm skeptical about. Yeah, I think Colton will take a little bit of time to come along, but I mean, you only have to look at Derek Carr's passer rating. It goes from 100 to 40 when he's under pressure. That right there is like the biggest thing that makes Penn so valuable. And the the two games he missed at the end of last season are the only two regular season games he's missed in his whole career. So, I mean, I, I don't understand people wanting to get rid of him either. I think they're still kind of mad about his holdout from last year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then the team struggled and they were kind of blaming everybody. And Penn certainly got a, a good chunk of that. Well, and, and I get there, there's there's priorities for this team, too. Right. We, and we're going to talk a little bit here in a minute about Khalil Mack. And so I think some folks, um, it's almost like they look at it as the money in their wallet. And that's like, well, geez. If suddenly I take back 50 bucks, I can take that 50 bucks and give it to this guy. But in reality, you know, the the needs that are created, sure, you can go take money, get rid of a guy. You still got to pay him, by the way. But you can you can do that, pay Mac, get him in. But then you got a gaping hole on the left side. And to me, like you said, I think Miller's going to take some time. I really like Parker on the right side. I think he's going to win out and probably play a lot this year, too. Um, But I don't know about you, but thinking about John Gruden, I don't see – some people have been saying, hey, well, maybe Miller will get some time on the right side too just to get him some action. I think I don't think Gruden's going to do that. I think Gruden's going to say, hey, you're my left guy. You're my left tackle of the future, uh, and I want you to play that position, understand the position, even if you're not playing in the games at first because Penn's there, is just learn it, understudy with him, and become the best you can so that when it is time for you to take over, you're ready to go. Well, there's some guys that you can switch back and forth like that. But with Colton, his issue is just technique. Yeah. So you don't want to teach him technique for the left side and then just be like, okay, well, today we're going to work on the right. You know, when you're planning for him to be your left tackle, you want him to get something down, you know, before you just start moving him around and and completely confuse the guy. 
Yeah, that that to me, and and I think <laughs> you know you 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 coach football. You're our 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 senior analyst, and anybody who reads your stuff knows um, uh, that you know you know the game of football really well. Most most more, I mean, more than most of us, right? From a technical perspective. But I think people look at that as being easier than it is to your point, right? Which is you don't just go from one to the other. There is different technique, as you mentioned. There's a different mentality too. There's a different, you have different roles, uh, especially depending on who your quarterback is. And, and to me, I just think, you know, if you don't need to rush him along, why would you? Okay. Now, if he comes in and he's and he already put weight on, right? We saw that the other day. The reports coming out of uh, coming out of Napa, um, they's already bulked up, which is a great sign. Um, at the same time, you you don't want to hurry him along. So, in my view, I, I think you, you you keep Penn, you let Penn continue to do what he does as long as he's healthy. Now, if he's not healthy, all bets are off, and I think that would be a huge concern if if he's not healthy. Chris, um, I, I the Raiders got to do something. They're going to have to figure out something to to protect that left side. I like Colton Miller. I really do think if it came down to it, they could start him right away because they're going to give him help. I mean, you you could put Lee Smith over there. Good point. You can run a lot of six-man protections. You don't have to leave Miller out on an island. And, I mean, this is a kid that can move. He's a big guy. He's he's getting bigger. Um, you know, I, I don't see why they couldn't start him if Donald Penn wasn't available. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be interesting to watch. I know I know a lot of folks, including the media, uh, the writers up in the Bay Area, and of course the rest of us uh, outside of Oakland or um, in the online world or in the radio world are going to be watching that because it's going to be one of the biggest stories, I think, of, of camp. Now, the other folks that were not on the list, which was very, very encouraging, uh, is uh, the rookie Nick Nelson. Of course, he's coming off a knee injury, a little cleanup of his knee. Uh, then Darion, or Garyon Conley and Obi Mellon Fonwu both also not on. Of course, when I when you say that to Raider fans, what do they follow with? The word yet. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Typical Raider Nation reaction, which is everybody's been so conditioned to disappointment and, uh, the, and and guys like this getting injured. But but that was really encouraging to see that they're so far ready to go now. When they put the pads on this weekend, we'll see who uh, who survives through attrition. But um, that was very encouraging, I believe. Yeah, and I, I really like Nelson. He's of all three of them. I mean, we know what Conley can do. Obi, I'm really hoping he can step up and claim one of those safety spots. Uh, but Nelson's a real scheme fit. He's got good lateral quickness. He's great at those 50-50 balls. He doesn't get beat by double moves. The only real like puzzle about him is he was an all-state wide receiver in Maryland in high school. But then he didn't have a single interception in uh, college, even yeah. though he had like 42 pass breakups. Yeah. So it'll it'll be kind of interesting to see what they can get out of him. He might end up being the the slot corner this year if he looks really good. Yeah. There's there's uh, there's a lot of potential. I know that Raider fans were a little concerned with the draft, of of course, at the top of the draft with Miller. Uh, and that offensive line rush, and of course, a, 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 a alignment out of a small school uh, in PJ Hall. But I'm telling you, if this if this draft is seventy to seventy five percent a hit, meaning that these guys can come in and all contribute right away, uh, it's going to look pretty dang stellar for Reggie McKenzie and John Magru- and John Gruden because, uh, like you said, you have guys like that, even like a guy like Marcel Aitman, who you know could make the roster. He might be one of the last guys to make the roster. Uh, but you just look at that talent, raw talent, and and if you have a coaching staff like I believe now that the Raiders have, that will get the most out of their talent. I'm I, you're going to see some surprises there, and we're going to talk about surprises uh, a little later. Um, now, I don't know if you saw this USA Today. John Gruden made a comment. Uh, he did an interview. Of course, he was doing some preseason interviews, uh, and he said to Jarrett Bell of USA Today, "If I can't get it done, I'm going to I'm, I'm not going to take their money." So John Gruden, big criticism right over the off season from from folks, especially outside of Raider Nation, was you're paying this guy ten million dollars a year for ten years, and so he better win right away. Now Gruden, in saying this, in my view, uh, is saying exactly the right thing, which is look, it's 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 a bottom line, it's a numbers game, it's a it's a win loss proposition. If I don't win, then I don't deserve that money. Uh, and, and that's refreshing to hear a guy say that. And, and Gruden is who he is. I mean, he's, he's salt of the earth. He's going to tell it like it is. Uh, but I like how he's taken on that criticism. 
Well, and the other thing that's that's I mean, everybody hears that hundred million dollar number and they kind of freak out about it. But he had a great job at ESPN. Yeah, he didn't come back to coach the Raiders because they're offering him a hundred million dollars. He could have had that sitting in a booth. The guy wants to coach. He wants to coach for the Raiders. And it's one of those things where, yeah, the money's great, but I could see him just about doing it for free. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing. In the world of basketball and in football, I don't know, I guess the term might just be um, um, a football guy. But to me, it's like the gym rat, right, in basketball, which is it doesn't matter if, if, if he wasn't doing Monday Night Football and he wasn't coaching. He would be on a field somewhere. Uh, and, and that's, that's the love of the game. That's the desire to, to continue to achieve, to continue to coach and get the most out of, uh, of guys playing the game. And to me, and you coach too, so you know what that's like. I, I coached, uh, primarily, I only coached a, f- a couple of years of football, um, uh, junior football, but, but mostly coached baseball and basketball. And that was what is always to me, uh, it never co- gets out of your blood. It really doesn't. You always want to do it. I haven't coached baseball now for four years after doing it for 23. And uh, I miss it. Every time I turn on a baseball game, I'm like, gosh, if I was on that field, I'd be doing this. I'd be doing that. So to see a guy who loves it that much, Chris, um, and to see it in a coach like that is refreshing. And to me, changes the culture immediately. Yeah. I mean, anytime you have that just genuine authentic- authenticity, I mean, everybody's going to buy into it. And I mean, doing something you love, you can get up at three o'clock in the morning and be happy (laughs) about it. It's not the same thing as, you know, going to work early and being miserable. Um, Yeah, it's it's really refreshing to have a guy that, you know, loves the franchise is and would do anything to get it back to its prominence. Well, and, and, and you saw what happened this weekend um, um, up in Richmond uh, with the party that Gruden threw for fans. And, and to me, you know, there's, there's people who do that sort of thing, Chris, because it's the right PR thing to do and it looks good. But that's not John Gruden. That party that he threw uh, and, and really welcomed everybody there, to me, shows uh, exactly the perfect word which he used, was, which was authenticity. This is a guy who... Um, I really believe wants to win, wants to win fast because he wants to give the people of Oakland something really special uh, before they leave and, and come here to Las Vegas. And to me, you know, that is such a, a, a window into character, right? Which is you care enough about the people. You understand what the fans mean. They pay the ticket prices. Uh, they're the ones watching TV. They're the ones out there buying merchandise. And so he gets that. And, and again, it's the whole package. And to me, that's why I said at the time, Chris, John Gruden coming back to the Raiders, of course, fantastic for the organization and for Raider Nation, but even better for football. Don't you think overall, I mean, for the game, having him back is, is a big deal? I mean, even if you hate the Raiders, I think it would be impossible to watch John <laughs> Gruden and not get excited. Yeah. I, I mean, from your couch, you want to get up and you want to hit somebody. It's <laughs> It's impossible to quantify just, you know, what what he brings in, in that aspect. Yeah, no, that that's so true. And, and, and that's what he does. That's what I said. Uh, I said one Sunday, I said, you know what? If, if, if John Gruden was you'd want to work for him because he's the kind of guy that would motivate you and you're having that bad day and you're dragging you're dragging ass into work and he's behind you and you're suddenly you're feeling like a million bucks because this guy talked you up and he's ready to go. So it'll be interesting to see what he's able to do with this roster this year. Uh, and a lot of change, you know, change is hard. It's not always easy to go from that. Now we move to Khalil Mack. So. To t- I mean, to me, a lot of Raider fans, especially uh, I, I would say some of the really well-informed Raider fans, including some of the other guys out there who have um, in the media or do podcasts, there's a lot of great. I mean, I don't think any team, with all due respect to everybody else, I don't think any team has the volume or the quality of fan podcasts and fan pages that Raider Nation does. And when you see those guys talking and girls talking about Khalil Mack, I get this weird, unusual feeling now, Chris, that they're trying to talk themselves into the fact, oh, it's going to be fine, right? Now, a month ago, I think we all thought that, and it was sincere, um, and and camp hasn't officially started, okay? It starts tomorrow, but uh, I'm starting to think that um, they could, this could be a little protracted. Is it going to go through all throughout camp? No. Could it go a couple more weeks? 
absolutely. Uh, we're not really hearing anything other than they're not close, but there has been no verification of that. But are, are you worried, Chris? Do you think Raider Nation should be worried about the Khalil Mack situation at this point? Uh, not really, because there's I, I don't think there's any chance he's missing any game checks. <laughs> he's scheduled to make $13.8 million this year, and he's not going to pass that up. The worst-case scenario is he plays this year on his fifth-year option, and then the team franchises him next offseason. Um, I, I think they're just it, there's a, a hard time for GMs to hand out you know, $20-plus million to a guy that's not a quarterback. So I'm sure it's going to take some, you know, some negotiations to get them to a number that they can both agree on. Yeah, and, and to me, so so knowing the history of the Raider organization, especially the the end of the tenure of Al Davis, um, the changing of the game with the salary cap, uh, and dare I say the two words that all Raider fans hate to hear, and that's uh, uh, Jamarcus Russell. Um, when you look at giving money, I, 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 I'm always, I always kind of cringe when I see Raider Nation say, pay the man anything he wants. Well, I get the sentiment there. The sentiment is, look, this guy is, 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 is the franchise on the defensive side. Give him the money he deserves. And, and I don't disagree with that. But you're in a situation now where you're waiting for the market to kind of set. And, and um, uh, Vinny Bonsignore, who comes on our radio show all the time and covers the Rams and the Chargers down in L.A. for the L.A. Daily News, he was talking about it today. He's like, look, both the Rams with Aaron Donald and the, the Raiders with Khalil Mack, they're kind of waiting on each other. Right. They're they're playing this little game. It's like, well, geez, let's see what they do with Donald. That'll set the price. And then the Rams are saying, well, geez, let's see what they do with Khalil Mack. And that'll set the market. Um, no one wants to 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 make that first move and either uh, and, and overpay, uh, thereby um, making the market go up uh, for another player, but also putting themselves in a situation. You have to be careful with the cap. Yeah, you don't want to end up in another uh, 2014 season where right. you got $50 million in dead money. Um, they do have Von Miller's deal out there Yeah, you know that you could kind of work parameters off of, but Von Miller only has three years in his deal that he makes over $20 million, and the uh, Broncos can save about $37 million by cutting those last two years. So I, I can see where the agents and the, the teams are definitely kind of – waiting for each other to get it figured out. Yeah. that And and the other thing is you have to uh, – people, I think, look at this as being such a personal thing and and with players because they, they, they like the player. They know how important he is to the future of the, of the team on the defensive side. At the same time, the business side of it, as we're talking about right here, you have to be careful not to – to to just reward a guy uh, and go out on a limb and give him too much money and and listen we don't know what's happening on the inside we don't know how realistic uh, the numbers are uh, on both sides you know of course you're going to always try to even if you want a guy to feel good about staying you, you're you, you don't want to overpay and you're not going to come in and say well yeah we'll give you whatever you want just write the check so so there is some negotiation there why it didn't happen in the off season. Um, Frankly, the Raiders have all the leverage, Chris. I mean, they don't, like you said, they don't have to pay. They have a, a year left with in his option, and then they can tag him next year. So, so they have the upper hand. There doesn't mean you're going to have a happy player, of course, if he doesn't feel like he's been um, respected or given what he's due. But I don't, I don't see where the Raiders are, have to be in any specific hurry, uh, unless Mac went out and started becoming a malcontent and talking a lot, which I don't see him doing. So, so. I mean, you agree with that? You agree they have all the leverage there? Yeah, he's under contract this season. I mean, he either plays or he doesn't get paid. So <laughs> from a leverage standpoint, the only thing the team really gains is making him happy and having him locked up for a long term so they can start planning what they're going to do you know, next off season, what their cap numbers are going to look like. But as far as having Mac play for the Raiders this season, he's under contract. Yeah, and, 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 and you, you – Khalil Mack is not Julio Jones, okay? Uh, that situation is, as you all know, uh, signed a new contract and now he wants another one. 
uh, because the the price in the market went up, of course, thanks to Sammy Watkins. Uh, and so so now, uh, but I don't see Khalil Mack doing that. His personality, his character, and what you've seen now, business is business. Sometimes you got to get nasty when it comes to business. But I just don't see a situation like that. And and my guess is he maybe misses a week of camp. Um, I'm going to make that prediction that maybe uh, first few days he's not there. Uh, he's in great shape, as we all know, so so I don't think he'll miss too much, but he's got to learn the system. So to me, I, I think they will um, either have the conversation, which will be, look, you need to get into camp because we're not going to we're not going to do anything yet. Uh, and we'll talk about it in the off season or we'll talk about it throughout the season uh, and get him there. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, uh, no one said he's not going to show up tomorrow either, right? Well, training camp is is mandatory, so if they really wanted to play hardball, they could start finding him too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting that that's the other thing too is you have with that new coaching staff and that kind of new culture being developed there, um that's the last thing you want, right? Is a guy that doesn't show up, uh especially a guy of that stature. But it'll be interesting because I just don't see them uh kowtowing to uh, a player either. I don't care who it is. And um, if he doesn't show up tomorrow, uh, then then we'll see what happens and what the the Raiders play is. Uh, but uh, but we'll see. Maybe he'll he'll uh, he'll get there early uh, in the morning and, and it'll put to rest kind of some of that talk and we'll see how it goes. So we'll see what happens with Khalil Mack. Now, let's shift gears a little bit, Chris, to uh, a great post that you had a great story up on silver and black today dot com. And this was about John Gruden and um uh, about run pass options. So, so you wrote this piece because um, of 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 what Gruden has been known by. And uh, going back to when he got hired, you wrote another story, kind of how people had really overplayed and really taken out of context Gruden's comment about throwing the game back to 1998. But um, knowing what he's been like uh, over the course of the years, talk about the RPOs, Gruden's kind of background with them, uh, and and why we don't think that we'll see a bunch of them in Oakland this season. Well, everything that he had talked about before the owners' meeting was how much he didn't like them. Uh, he called them ridiculous protection offense because you're leaving, you know, pass rushers unblocked. And the quarterback he was talking to, Kaya from uh, Miami, actually got one of his teeth crushed when the uh, linebacker fired off and, and decked him. Um, I, I, then at the owner's meeting, uh, Gruden started talking about that 1998 comment saying, you know, we're going to have all the analytics, we're going to run RPOs. So it was just kind of an interesting change from what he had been saying about him before. Yeah, and, and, and of course, he, 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 Gruden's going to change because – things have changed, right? They're, 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 he's going to do some things that the way he's always done them, but then there's also going to be things. You have to look at your talent. You have to look at your roster. You have to look at what um, the league is doing, what other teams are doing uh, to, to, to figure it out. But clearly, uh, in, and you talk about, excuse me, you talk about this in the story, right? Which is um, you, can, you can look at what's happened and you talk to Austin Gale, Pro Football Focus, about it as well. And um, um, I, I thought that his content... Uh, or his comments, I should say, uh, will were interesting as well because uh, it's it's he, in essence he said it's hard to kind of determine where he'll lean on it, but given kind of the the novelty of it and kind of what's been going on, it just doesn't fit in with Gruden's perspective and his philosophy on football. Well, it depends on what you um, you want to go off of as far as his philosophy because if you go off of like Andy Reid. Kansas City ran um, – oh, man, where's my numbers here? They ran 118 <laughs> RPOs last year. But then I was thinking, you know, Sean McVay with the Rams kind of fits maybe more of what he was going to do, and he only ran eight. Right. So it, it's, it does gain about league-wide. The average was about four and a half yards um, per RPO run last year and they scored 37 touchdowns. Mm. So it kind of depends on, on who you think, you know, Gruden's offense is more going to look like. And since we haven't seen him coach in 10 years, it, it's kind of hard to, to, to guess. Cause that's really all you would be doing. Yeah. And with Derek Carr too, you talked about that, right? Which is, um, um, with, with kind of 
that aggressive tendency uh, um, um, with with uh, with counterplays, and and you talked about this in the story, um, and 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 the injuries, right? Um, because uh, because Carr has been injured, and and so they're going to do everything they can to make sure he stays on the field. As Gruden has said, they their success is directly linked to one another, uh, and so so to me, limiting the exposure of your quarterback, limiting the opportunity for him to get hurt, points to. Yeah, they may use it, right? But it's not going to be something where you're going to see him uh, pull an Andy Reid and do a ton of them. No, I don't think it'll be that you know big of a thing. I, I think you are going to see him because, I mean, they are effective. You mm-hmm. you basically make the defense uh, pick the play for you. Are you going to run the ball where you have a numbers advantage, or is the defense going to flow that way? And then you're going to throw a high percent throw with an open window, you know, so that they are effective. Um, I think, you know, keeping Carr healthy is going to be Gruden's main priority. And I don't think he's going to want to, you know, leave him vulnerable to taking any kind of open hits. No, and that's where we're talking about um, off the air a bunch of times the last few weeks about the Raiders and kind of how we thought they did. Matt Gutierrez has been doing a piece um, on each quarter of the season and kind of projecting where the Raiders are going to finish. And um, I tend to I tend to be not because I'm a pessimist, but I tend to believe it's going to be on the lower end of the eight and a half wins that um, uh, Vegas has set on the line. Right. And that's not because I don't think they can win 10, 11 games. I think they can. But to me, to your point about protecting the quarterback, protecting Derek Carr, I think so much of the future um, is hinged on making sure that this offense is adopted and executed well that this year might be that year where, okay, we're going to make sure we keep him healthy. We're going to make sure that we run this offense. We learn it. We get it moving and have it be successful, but not take some risks that you might take uh, in years where you're really trying to, to win. And, and, and don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the Raiders aren't going to try to win every game they're in. But um, to me, limiting risk around the quarterback uh, and around some of the other positions too and some of the other players making sure that they gain the confidence – gain the experience and succeed is so very important. I mean, I think next year will certainly be a lot better year two of any system is yeah. just because it'll be, you know, more the back of his hand and, and a lot less thinking, but I don't recall Gannon ever really protecting his quarterbacks to the point that, you know, it, it would hinder the game plan or it right. would hinder the offensive execution. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree with that. I, and I just think that I think it's hard because I, I, I've watched the pas- passionate nature of Raider Nation, Chris, and um, I see already people setting themselves up for, I think, disappointment. And then I see the opposite of people who think that it's going to not go well, uh, who are going to be pleasantly surprised. So it, it's really interesting to see kind of how that polarizes folks um, uh, in the fan base. Now, um, one of the things we talked about earlier, we talked about Colton Miller and the rookie class coming in. And Hayden Adonley, our senior NFL writer, uh, wrote a piece on this as well. And I wanted to talk with you a little bit about rookie expectations because, uh, you know, everybody expects, especially if a guy's first, second, or third rounder, uh, there's a lot of high expectations, I think, uh, of, of fans and of NFL players in general, not just, just guys on the Raiders or, or their draft class. But I wanted to walk through a little bit. We talked about Colton Miller. I think we you were clear kind of where you thought he was going to be on that one. So let me ask you a couple other guys here that I think people are excited about. You also mentioned Nick Nelson. We talked about him a little bit. Um, but I think there's some guys where you they're being underappreciated and they will actually make a bigger contribution. P.J. Hall, as long as he's healthy, I think is one of those guys. Um, but if you look at uh, uh, on the defensive side, Arden Key, what do you think of Arden Key? What's a realistic expectation as an edge rusher for him along with Cleo Mack and Bruce Irvin? Where do you see him going? And if fa- if it's a good year for him, what does it look like? Uh, I think uh, Hayden was on point with he's going to be the third um, pass rusher. He'll he'll be the first uh, brought in, you know, for somebody to get a breather. Um, he's been working with Aaron Day of D line videos, a really good defensive line coach. And what he told me about Key was uh, he's a hard worker. He's extremely competitive. He wants to get better. Uh, he said he has a solid football IQ. Um, and 
you would think with as much you know fan support or is around him he wouldn't be coachable but he says he's really receptive to criticism he's really humble and he wouldn't be surprised if he wins defensive player of the year wow or defensive rookie of the year i mean yeah um and and i could honestly see that if he's back to his 2016 form because the guy's really he's he's more of a von miller than a cleo mack where he's just quick off of the snap and there were so many times that a tackle didn't even have a chance to get a hand on him uh it'll be a little different in the nfl where the tackles are much better and much longer so it'll be really interesting to see if he can translate that speed if he can get inside so he can use his hands um I could definitely see him as a defensive rookie of the year, especially as much as the media loves sacks. Yeah, and you did a great piece on this, too, uh, in his work during the offseason, during the break, because he was working his tail off, right? He was, to your point, um, working working hard, and he's a hard – and that that's what you want with a rookie, especially with the issues that he went through uh, and his stock dropping because of those off-the-field issues. Uh, but this kid, man, I'm telling you um, – I just like what I see there, and especially with how he's treated this offseason and preparing to become a professional. Uh, and so so I, my expectations of him are actually very high, and, and I agree with you and with Hayden that uh, he'll be that third pass rushing defensive end for them. Now, Maurice Hurst. Now, Maurice Hurst, uh, Big Mo, um, everybody, I think, realizes, uh, and, and except for those that are still kind of naysayers who are concerned about his health condition, um, Everyone, I think, is aligned on this one that this guy is going to come in and have impact directly. Um, do you think at all that that is perhaps expecting too much of a kid? Uh, you're not with this guy because he could have <laughs> easily been a top ten pick. Um, and you got Paul Gunther, who's really good with defensive line games. Uh, he's going to get a lot of one on one schemed for him, especially with as much attention as Mac is going to get with Bruce Irvin on the other side. Maybe a PJ Hall in the middle as well. Uh, he'll he'll have opportunities, and that's really what you need. You gotta just make the most of them. I, he's another guy that, with Hall, uh, Key, and uh, Hurst, just those three guys alone, if they live up to their potential, this might be one of the best draft classes the Raiders have ever had. Absolutely, that if they all if they hit on all three of those guys, um, there's no question. And then you toss in some of the others, like a Nick Nelson, if he's if he's a good player, uh, and and even if he's not a starter, but he's a, he's a good role player and contributes um, and and grows. That is going to be, I think, something that is um, um, huge. And and you're right, it could end up being the best class ever. Now, um, a guy I talked about earlier too, uh, Marcel Aitman. Here's a guy who. Um, has I think has good uh, size, has great hands, okay, uh, but not exactly fast. I mean, he's not he doesn't have blinding speed, uh, but to me, he's a guy who's going to be sure-handed. And okay, what have the Raiders lacked uh, over that? And I, I think he could end up. I think he's a, a guy on the on probably going to be on that borderline of making the team or not making the team. Uh, but with the issues you've had with Seth Roberts, with the, the other issues you've had in the receiving core, here's a guy that um, you know is going to catch the ball. Uh, and and to me, if he can show his value in doing that and and perhaps uh, grow enough that where his speed isn't as much of an issue, he could end up making this squad. Well, I a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on speed, but really what you need is the ability to create space when you're a wide receiver. Uh, if you have short area speed where you can beat somebody on a, you know, a quick jab step or something, that's the same thing as, you know, not everybody has to be Randy Moss going down the, the sideline. The only problem I think he's going to run into and why I think he'll make the, he'll be on the practice squad is just how many guys are ahead of him. Yeah. Uh, this is a really deep wide receiver group. Yeah, that that to me is um, is is one of the stories of the offseason. And I think that, you know, it, it, the, the the angst that was caused with Michael Crabtree and, and, and fans who really didn't want him to go or fans that really wanted him to go because of uh, perceived locker room issues. Uh, to me, it, it couldn't have worked out better 
the way things have happened, uh, bringing in, uh, of course, Jordy Nelson. And that's the thing, too. You talk about that and, 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 and such a great point, Chris, which is creating space. Uh, and if you look at Jordy Nelson, sh- soon after they hi- or they uh, signed him, you did a story on that too, right? A-, a breakdown on how he creates space. And to me, as a quarterback, if I'm Derek Carr and I'm looking at these guys, Martavis Bryant, I'm looking at him. Um, boy, I- I'm walking into this this training camp feeling like a, a brand new guy, right? Because you have you have receivers, because you know he's been watching film of these guys. You you have receivers who are going to go out and create that space, create plays, and, and take pressure off your quarterback. Man, and everybody's obsessed with that 30-year-old number, but Jordy Nelson can still run. Uh, you've got, like you said, Martavis Bryant. you got Amari Cooper. you got Jordy Nelson. I mean, you can max protect and you can run two or three route plays and give Derek Carr four or five seconds in the pocket where he's just going to shred a defense. There's so much they can do with these guys um, that just, you know, that blinding speed, it's not what makes a football player, even though it works great in video games. <laughs> yeah. And, and to me, that's, that's one of the issues is you give him the, 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 the time back there. And if the offensive line is holding up the way it should, then um, that's where you're going to start to do damage. And I, and I, I really believe that. I think it's going to take time for this defense to gel, but I think the offense is going to put up a lot of numbers and you're right about Jordy Nelson. I think Jordy Nelson is perhaps in, in my view, one of the most underrated receivers that has played in the last decade um, because he's there, he's in Green Bay, he's with Aaron Rodgers and the cast they had around him, uh, and he just quietly does his job. Uh, and, and he's not a big talker, and he won't be in Oakland, but he is somebody, to me, is going to help immensely an Amari Cooper. Uh, and even a Martavis Bryant, who's had some trouble off the field, right? Here's a guy who's so even-keeled, um, he's a quiet leader. And to me, that's going to be a big deal in the locker room. And some of these guys, uh, if they, if they get a, if they get challenged or if they're they're struggling a little bit, he's the perfect guy, in my view, in the locker room to keep those guys focused on what the end of the day the prize is, and that's winning football games and catching and doing your job. Yeah, they were talking earlier in the off season about Nelson being a second quarterback in the wide receiver room. Uh, Derek Carr talked about the first thing that Nelson came up and talked to him about was, you know, how do you want this route run? Where do you want this one to break off? So once they have a little bit of time in training camp to get on the same page, uh, it's going to look really good in preseason. Yeah, no, it's, (laughs) yeah, and it's going to be fun to watch them come together. And, and, and Amari Cooper, you know, to, to, to finally get him to play in the slot more often and to be where he should be, uh, and to free him up and, 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 and get some, some help there is going to be a big deal. And I'm excited. I I really don't have any worries about the offense. I, I really don't. Um, outside of the offensive line and how that's going to come together. Um, to me, that's not uh, a, a concern of mine as much as some of the other things, uh, especially on the defensive side and how that's going to gel together. But uh, this is this is going to be a top 10 offense. I really believe that in my heart of hearts. And um, it's going to start with that group because they're going to really create it. And then, of course, you add the running game uh, and the addition of some some real physical fullbacks. And I like what I see out of the Raiders there as well. Now, if you look at um, Chris, if you look at camp um, and uh, when we come back from the break, we're going to take a little break here and hear some from our sponsors. But when we come back from the break, I want to talk to you and, and, and have us both kind of go through one surprise, one, one pleasant surprise we'll get out of camp as it relates to personnel, and then one surprise as far as someone who might not perform as well as uh, as people are expecting. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on Spreaker, the live podcast. We'll be back right after this message. I cut off Mark Bedain. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> All right, you're back here, Silver and Black Today podcast on Wednesday, July 25th, the day before the start of Raiders training camp. Uh, I'm Scott Colbranson, joined by our senior NFL analyst, Chris Reed, and we're talking Raider football. Okay, Chris, so we're back and we're talking about surprises. uh, And again, we're just prognosticating. Thank God, man, tomorrow. You know what? Tomorrow we get to actually... Stuff starts happening, right? And particularly Friday when they put, uh, they get on the field and practice. But no more guessing, no more predictions. We actually get to talk about real stuff, isn't that? That's that's freaking great for me. I'm ready for it, man. 
I'm ready for some new film. I'm tired of watching 2017. <laughs> I was going to say, as much film as you've watched since going back um, to pre-draft, and then, of course, all the free agent signings. Um, uh, and there's nobody better at it, man. Uh, so if, if folks, if you haven't checked out Chris's stuff up on the website, silverandblacktoday.com, please do so. Go there and search his name. You'll find it. Uh, and, dude, I still am mar- I mean, I'm just blown away. Chris did a piece, um, and I'm, go- I'm getting off subject here, but I got to talk about it. Chris did a piece on every throw that Derek Carr has made over the last two seasons. Now, the fact that you're still married after that <laughs> is is a shocker, man. Because you, but but I know how much you love the game and how much you love watching film. But that's a great piece, um, and I, I invite people to go read that now. Okay, so surprises. Who's the one guy you think on this roster that's going to surprise people when we get done with camp? I was going to go with Arden Key, but we already talked about him, so I'll go with Reggie Nelson. Um, I think getting in a too high safety set so he only has to read half the field instead of them putting him in the the middle of the field thinking he could run sideline to sideline is going to help him out a lot. Uh, The pass rush is going to be a lot better, so he's not going to be back there for a few seconds. We could see – I don't know if he'll get back to leading the league in interceptions like the last (laughs) time he was with Paul Gunther – but he definitely won't be the whipping boy in the secondary this season. Yeah, no, I agree with that. It's going to be it, – I expect him to, to really come on, uh, and, and I know a lot of people um, – some people want to write him off, right, especially with some of the signings that occurred over the over the course of the offseason. But, but I really like um, what what he has to offer. And you're right, the, uh, the defense, the scheme, and, and to me, man, it's just – it's focus. I think some of these guys – um, you know, different players require a different approach. They require a different kind of uh, focus and uh, on on uh, what motivates them. And I think there's certain coaching staffs and certain coaches who who play into that well. And then there's other coaches who are more hands off. And for some guys, that's not the right thing, right? You might have a guy who really needs somebody to be on top of them, and not in a negative way, just to keep on them motivated. And clearly, under Jack Del Rio, that was not the kind of atmosphere you had on that roster? Honestly, it, the coaching staff is what bothered me the most about Reggie Nelson last season because from a coaching standpoint, I don't understand how you can watch a guy struggle over and over doing something and not change anything. Yeah, It's kind of like uh, that quote that Einstein had where the definition of insanity is doing the same thing <laughs> over and over and expecting different results. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you're right, and that was the, I think, I think most of all, when you see guys and a lot of a lot of the frustration, I think, from fans when you're watching a game and a team's not performing well, you jump on the players because they're the ones on the field. They're the ones you watch. But it was evident at midseason and we don't need to to, to retrace the steps of the, the coaching staff that's gone now. But clearly, you're right. When you got a guy who's struggling uh, to me, you know, I equate I got I got kids, right? I got five kids. And so when they're in school. Uh, and they're struggling, and I see a teacher, for example, not helping them in a way that 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 challenges them or finds them the help they need so that they can try to overcome their challenges. Yeah, it 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 gets to me because to me that means you're you're not really caring about that person. You're not really trying to get them to be successful. So I agree with you there. Now my my surprise, Chris, for camp, it's not new because I've been sticking with it uh, uh, for weeks now, maybe months. Uh, and and I know a lot of people disagree with me, and and they'll say, well, it doesn't really matter. I think Doug Martin's going to come out of camp, and I think he's going to be a, a player. I don't think he's going to be a guy that challenges Marshawn Lynch. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying he's going to be a thousand yard rusher, but I think if you go by uh, if you go by the 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 rule of three years, which every three years he has a good year, <laughs> um, uh, you know, he looked like a guy who had nothing left in the tank at times. Um, but he also was not in the in a, in a good system for his his style of play. He was also in the doghouse last year and didn't get a lot of time. I think here's a guy who's going to be a change of pace guy and has an edge over some of the younger running backs on the roster, like Washington and so on, where um, he will be a guy that that will come out of camp and will be a good role player to 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 spell uh, Marshawn Lynch and he'll break a few here and there because uh, I do think he's got at least one last good rush in him uh, and he's coming home so I think I, I like players who are coming home they have something to prove one last time. 
Yeah, and if you like you pointed out, I mean, he's due for a fourteen hundred yard rushing season. This is the <laughs> third year. Well, and and you don't I mean, have you don't have to get that from him, right? Though, Chris, I mean, if if he's a guy who comes in and gets hell six or seven hundred yards, right? That would be a huge year, and 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 you can bring him in um, uh, on on plays when Lynch is take when when Lynch is off the field, and also he can he can catch the ball out of the backfield as well. Yeah, I think he had like thirty three receptions last season. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing that does kind of worry me is you know before his last fourteen hundred yard season. Uh, he was averaging somewhere between 3.6 and 3.7. His last two seasons, he's had 282 carries, and he's only averaged 2.9 yards per carry. Yeah. So that's my only he, – he does seem like he's winding down. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, and, and I think some of that you can look at uh, what was going on um, um, down there and, and, and the line that they had there. But but you're absolutely right. So, so yes, he's a gamble, but I live in Las Vegas, so I'm taking a big one. Um, now, who do you think uh, people are really, I think, either favorable on or high on that you think might disappoint going in uh, – coming out of camp? I was going to say Doug Martin, but I don't really want to do that. To you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you could do that. You could come on, man. You could do that. Throw it. You could throw uh, it at me. That's all fine. It, it just has the feel of uh, when they brought in MJD, uh. and um, you know his his only real memorable play was when he punted a fumble like ten yards in the air to Derek Carr. It just kind of <laughs> has that feel. But like you said, he he doesn't have to be the bell cow. They have Marshawn Lynch. Um, you know, and, and he can catch the ball. I'm personally, I think uh, Richard is going to end up being the number two. Mm-hmm. But Gruden does really like Doug Martin, so I mean, you could you could certainly be right. Yeah, but I, I also think that if, if if he's not cutting it, he could be gone pretty quickly as well, um, because they they got guys right. So the, the they've built this roster, the, the 90 man roster. They they have a lot of options there. As well, so we'll see what they what they do uh, and where they go. So that's it for me now. If I look at guys that I think are going to come out of camp and and might be a disappointment, uh, and and it's a new guy too, uh, and just because I just feel like yeah, good veteran, but I just I don't have a lot of confidence, and that's Sharice Wright. I know, I know, I know. Uh, I think Hayden will kill me over that one. He really likes him. But but I, I just think there, when you look at where he's been and what he's done, um, will, will he be a solid player? I just he, Perhaps. I just don't think he's going to be uh, a guy who's going to light anything on fire or, or end up um, really making a huge difference this year. I remember him getting chewed up pretty bad on, on a lot of double moves. Uh, he did play in a lot of zone coverages, and I mm-hmm. think he's more built for man. So he could certainly turn it around if he's if he gets an opportunity. I'm kind of seeing him somewhere, you know, four, maybe number five on the depth chart. But you know, a good preseason might might move him up there. Yeah, that could be, and 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 we'll see. I mean, I think there's they have options there, right? And they're still looking. I think that's the thing too is I I don't think the Raiders are done pulling guys uh, off the waiver wire. Um, uh, they just talked to Breland the yeah. other day, and he ended up leaving without a contract. Yeah. I haven't seen if he's signed anywhere yet. No, he, I know he was going uh, – was he going to Minnesota, right, or somewhere like that? Um, he was he, going to talk to KC and okay, then I think Indianapolis after that. That's right, the Colts. That's right. So so we'll see. But, I, I yeah, I mean I think we, people got spoiled early in the in the year when everybody who went to Oakland didn't leave, right? They went and they got a contract and they signed. Uh, but I think as you get this late in the game – the guys have a little more leverage. These these guys are walking around, so they're going to try to get the best deal that they can, unless they really just want to go play for Gruden or Gunther. Um, and to me, that that'll make a difference. But yeah, Breland, a great player. We'll see where he ends up. But I think there's going to be names. There's always names, right? There's always guys uh, for whatever reason that get cut loose or become available, or still are free agents that are now looking for a place to sign. And so we'll see what happens there. Uh, but the the other guy too, um, I'm going to go back just just for 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 a moment. Uh, because I really am, am, am just really high on, on a couple guys actually, um, and and on the defense and on the offense. And to me, that the way that that Gruden plays his offense, right, um, and the toughness which he likes to to kind of pound the rock, so to speak, as he calls it, um, Keith Smith. I think I think Keith Smith is going to be. Um, a, an integral part of this offense and going to be a fan favorite before it's all said and done. 
Oh man, if you remember Zach Crockett, I could definitely see that happening. <laughs> yeah, I remember everybody loves Zach Crockett. Yeah, and I mean that's going to be, and they're going to need it too, right? With with some of the defense. I mean, you look at the 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 Chargers defense, the Broncos defense, both going to be stout inside the division. I don't think Kansas City is going to be um, uh, all that much, uh, although they're not exactly terrible but i do think that those two defenses between denver and and the chargers although the chargers always have a way of imploding and and finding their way to the the injury reserve so we'll see what happens there but i i just like him man i think i think he is all oakland i mean i think he is all raiders mentality old school thought and and was just underutilized uh down in dallas and i think that's why um uh when when Gruden took over. It was very easy for him to to go get him uh, uh, with Rich coming over too as a special teams coach. So I think I think you'll see him do a lot um, for for the Raiders, and I'm excited to see him as well. Now on the defensive side, anybody else that that sticks out? I for me, Derek Johnson. I think it's going to be a huge huge get for the Raiders as well. I think he fits the scheme perfectly. Uh, what they had him do in Kansas City and what he's going to do in Gunther's system is the exact same thing. Uh, the only difference is, is Kansas City didn't have him line up in the A gap first. Wow. Uh, he'll be up at the you know at the line, and then he's either going to blitz or he's going to drop into a little hook zone, and that's exactly what Kansas City had him doing. And uh, he, he was really good at you know reading the quarterback, getting his hands on passes. Uh, he got Derek Carr a few times. Yeah. No, it's it, yeah, I agree with that, and I think it, again, leadership. Leadership is is so underrated. Um, if you're outside the team and you're just watching football, uh, getting guys together on the field and making sure that they're 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 focused on the same thing, that they're believing in the concept that you're doing and the philosophy that you have, is 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 everything to me. Um, uh, so if you have talented guys, you can have a team that's that's pretty talented that can overachieve if you have the right leadership, the right focus, the right coaching. And so I think that's where the, I think the Raiders defense is going to be watching the Raider defense to me this year. Uh, is going to be just as exciting as the offense because of the improvement I think you're going to see. Yeah, you'll see missteps here and there uh, and, and grow, growing pains. But, man, I, I just think – I think Raider fans are going to, to be shocked at, at the changes and uh, with the system that Gunther runs. To your point, uh, it's a lot more exciting to watch as a fan as well. Yeah, I mean, how long have people been clamoring for somebody in Oakland to blitz You know, <laughs> instead of watching everybody – play five yards off the line of scrimmage and drop back, you're going to see guys coming forward, QBs getting knocked down, and there's nothing prettier than Khalil Mack, you know, taking out a quarterback. <laughs> no, that's right. That's right. Just get, let's get him into camp uh, tomorrow and get that moving. So, no, it'll be, it'll be fun. Uh, and uh, we also, just a reminder, too, uh, we will have a couple things coming up. Number one is we have the show on Sunday uh, on CBS Sports Radio 1140 AM, which you can also catch streaming on radio.com so you can download the app if you're on your phone or you can listen to it in a web browser on your laptop or your desktop computer whatever you prefer you can also uh, download this podcast so our podcast and our radio show uh, all uh, go into the same feed which you can get on iTunes Google Podcasts Spotify we're now on Spotify here on Spreaker which we do live but also um, it 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 uh, it archives there as well. So so no matter where you listen, even on YouTube, so the the audio goes up on YouTube as well. So no matter where you listen, you can do that. I recommend you subscribe. That way you won't miss anything. Uh, as the season starts, we're going to be doing a lot more. On the show Sunday, we'll be delving into camp as well. David Stepanian, our correspondent, will have kind of a recap of the first couple of days and what's happening. Chris is also going to be on, right, man? You're going to join us on Sunday morning. Um, in addition to that, a reminder for those of you in Las Vegas or if you're close and you want to drive up for the weekend, the Raiders' first preseason game on August 10th, we're having a killer watch party with our brothers from the Las Vegas Sports or Sports Adrenaline Las Vegas. Um, we're going to have a watch party at uh, Legacy Stadium over at the Palazzo Hotel on the Strip. If you've never been there or seen it, check it out online. Really killer stuff. We're going to uh, not only have a watch party there. If you come in, uh, we'll put out a flyer real soon. If you bring that flyer in, you'll get discounts on drinks and food. Uh, and we're going to have giveaways uh, before the game. We'll have a conversation about the Raiders season and where it's going and what uh, fans there think. And then at halftime, 
we'll also have a discussion about the game thus far and the you know two series that we saw the first team offense play. Uh, but we'll also have giveaways. So if you come out, uh, you can win some things there. And for those of you know, Chris not being in Las Vegas, one of the big issues over the last year has been they started charging for parking, which like in Las Vegas is like a no no. Nobody wants to pay for parking when you come to Las Vegas because you're used to not doing it for the last 50 years. So, but the Palazzo, the Venetian there where we're having this party at Legacy stadium, no, no charge for parking. So you can get there. You don't have to worry about it. Um, but we want you to come out. Um, we've got a lot of folks who are already planning to come out. So do that and come say hello to us. Uh, we'd love to, to mix it up. And if you haven't met us before, we'd love to meet you and thank you for uh, your support. So um, now Chris, as we get into camp, uh, you are also busy outside of being a contributor on CBS Sports Radio here and on the website and here on the podcast. You're making the rounds, too. You are going to be uh, on a couple shows coming up, uh, and including Sunday, right? Yeah, Sunday with uh, Pillaging Podcast. Oh, I love those guys, man. They are, I don't know, if you haven't listened to that show and that podcast, uh, just phenomenal. Uh, fun guys and knowledgeable. They have great guests on there as well, and, and Chris will be on there too. So, so uh, hopefully they're going to they're gonna, um, have some drinks because you're going to start talking numbers with them. And, and like me, my, my head spins. I'm sure theirs will too. Yeah, I, I'm always worried about how many numbers I put in there. Pretty <laughs> soon it just sounds like a math teacher talking. That's right. You know, when, it's a funny story. When you were um, – when you did the story on RPOs and, and you sent it in and, and I was in there editing it um, and I saw that you talked to Austin Gale from PFF, I, I, my mind went to, oh my gosh, what does that conversation sound like? Like <laughs> they're guys, they're like going on numbers and cause, cause Austin is a total numbers guy. Um, yeah, most, most of that conversation was just him going, come on, man, I'm on vacation. Oh, was it really? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, that's funny. He's a great guy, but no, I mean, that is, that is great. And I, I know we're going to, just so people know, uh, during the season, we'll get Chris. He, I don't know if he's ready for it yet, but we're gonna, we'll get him on live video to talk through some of this stuff. Because I know people send me questions. I know they actually ask you out on Twitter because you're so responsive to people. But we'll, we'll do some video as well where we break this down, especially when we have game action, um, pivotal plays and things like that. So we'll, we'll do that because there's nobody better than breaking down film. Uh, than Chris, so it'll be a blast. But man, thanks for doing this tonight. And I know you'll be you'll be a lot more active here on the podcast and on the radio show as we head into the season. Yeah, thanks for having me, buddy. All right, so was it one twenty down there in Phoenix? <laughs> yeah, the, until like noon when it hit about one fifty. <laughs> yeah, we had I think one. Well, the official temperature, you know, the official temperature is always taken at the airport, right? So just like Phoenix, Vegas has different areas. And so on your east side, it gets hotter. And then I'm kind of in the south southwest side of the city. And I got home um, just before 6 o'clock or 530, and it was like 114. And, and as, I, go ahead. I'd love to be a weatherman here because you don't <laughs> even have to do any sort of preparation. You just show up. You say it's going to be sunny. It's going to be hot. Yeah, then no case. Especially, you know, I always tell people there's there's four weeks I don't like living here, and it's really mid to end of July to kind of mid to end of August, right? Because I actually like the heat. I just don't like when it's over 110. Like now, you guys have it all the time. I mean, I remember because my daughter's down at school there, and it's like December, and you guys are still getting 80 degrees when we have like 50s. So because <laughs> you're low desert, we're high desert. So it's different, but but people always kind of have a misconception um, that like here here it gets hotter as the day goes on. So by four or five o'clock is the hottest part of the day, whereas a lot of people are you know noon one o'clock. Uh, but because we're so far south, um, we get it uh, up until dinner time, which stinks because you get home from work and you want to go outside and play with your kids and you can't because your shoes will melt. Yeah, you'll be stuck to the sidewalk. <laughs> That's right. The newspaper here today put out a crate with – I don't know if you've seen it if you're on vacation or you're in an area where there's a lot of tourists. So you might have seen it. It's the, they call it the world's largest gummy bear. It's like a big package. It's a big gummy bear and it's like maybe a foot and a half, two feet high. And the newspaper here took a crate out downtown Las Vegas, near downtown Las Vegas, and put the gummy bear on top of the crate and just put a camera on it and let it melt. <laughs> so uh, it's always fun to see that. But we live in the desert, so we should expect it. Um, but Chris, man, thanks so much for doing that. I know we'll, we'll see some more content here from you during camp, and we'll talk to you Sunday on the show. 
Yeah, talk to you then, buddy. All right. That was Chris Reed, our senior NFL analyst. That's going to conclude our podcast tonight, guys. Thanks for joining us as we head into camp uh, here for the Raiders. I know everybody's excited. We appreciate your support. Again, check out the website, silverandblacktoday.com. And, of course, here on the podcast, you can download in all the places you like. You can also find us on CBS Sports Radio Sunday from 8 to 10 a.m. This this Sunday, we're only on from 8 to 9.30. Those dang Dodgers have another game. So they uh, the, our station is the flagship station in Las Vegas for the Los Angeles Dodgers. So we'll be on just for 90 minutes. Uh, but we'll get you up to speed on everything going on that is Raider football. As always, thank you guys, and we will talk to you very soon. 